you tonight? Fantastic. So welcome to this historic Whiskey Row speaker series. I am so excited to be up here. And look, we're going to get another special guest. Y'all didn't even know he was coming yet. We'll introduce him here in just a second. So presented by number 15, we want to thank you guys for joining us for this really historic moment here in a really special place. We're in a place where, you know, bourbon lore was created and has really a it evolved over time, and I could not think of two better people to be up here with me. So, uh, actually, and now three, because uh, Preston snuck in here in just a second. <laughs> so, let's go through and let's introduce first. Uh, we have first, he is the global brand, direct, global brand director of American and Indian Whiskey. We have Mr. Andrew Duncan. Big old round of applause for Mr. Andrew Duncan. Now, Andrew, we love that. You were here, but I mean, we, we have Julie in here, you know? Yeah, we do. Just a little I bit. I think they've heard of him. Uh, a little? A little? So he really needs no introduction, but his family legacy intertwined with the very essence of American whiskey. And tonight, we have the distinct honor of hosting this custodian of that legacy, a master distiller, a storyteller, living link to rich tapestry of bourbon past, Please give a humongous round of applause for Mr. Julian Van Winkle. Now, before I get into all the questions, everything like that, Preston, I didn't write anything amazing for you, but Preston needs no introduction either. If you know Julian Van Winkle, we also know Preston Van Winkle. Preston Van Winkle, please give him a huge round of applause for showing up with us today. We don't have a microphone, but I'm sure he'll come over and he'll add his two cents to anything that we have here today. That's right. So one thing I do want to say before we get into all this great Weller and Van Winkle that we have here tonight, that the special surprise that we had for everybody today was a 15-year-old pappy being poured behind the bar. $75 a pour. Now, there's something really special about that, isn't there? And I would like if uh, Julian doesn't mind to tell us where all of the proceeds of that bottle is going to go tonight. So Julian, tell us a little bit. Thanks, Chris. I might get my daughter Louise to come up there and talk uh, more about it. But I, if I if I screw up, she can come on up here. But uh, we have some good friends, uh, Robert and Helen Weiss, and their young boy who now is how old is Robert? S seven years old, seven or eight years old. Um, he has something called Morchio syndrome. Um, it's, uh, it stunts your height, it makes your bones not, uh, obviously the joints don't grow, and he's a very short little fella, but he's got an amazing spirit, and uh, this Morchio syndrome is very rare, it's like one in, I can't imagine how many millions, but um, yeah, it's, it's, there's a handful of people like that, but great family, um, so uh, I think Louise was really responsible to getting this fundraiser going for uh, Robert, and the, the, the website is rootingforrobert.org, and there's, there'll be a, a bunch of little uh, obvious little pieces of information that you can find about that. Around yeah, there. and we're going to have it linked to the website here, so if you don't get a chance to try one of these amazing 15-year uh, pappies to go uh, to this great charity, you can actually log on to the website at number 15. You'll be able to follow me. I'll add it to my website as well also at KrogerChrisPicks.com, but please go in and donate if you don't get a chance to taste this incredible bottle. So let's give a big round of applause for it all going to charity, right? Yes. <laughs> Okay. I'll just say that, um, you know, the, the secondary market has produced a really large number on a lot of our whiskey and rare whiskeys like Weller and, um, um, you know, a lot of the really whiskeys you can't find out there. But the good thing about the uh, secondary market is it's really helping these charities. So when they come up for live auctions or any auctions, the charities are really um, uh, reaping the benefits from the money that's raised for a a hundred dollar bottle of whiskey it might be three thousand somewhere depending on who's in the room and um so we're really grateful of that so um I appreciate you all uh, helping us out with um this little fella and um hope hoping to raise money for his syndrome and they do have they got some fda approval uh, possibly and uh so anyway it's working we've done three years of fundraisers for him and um it's been very positive so anyway glad to glad to help out thank you so much julian <laughs> 
All right, now it's the moment that we've all been waiting for. I mean, we were having a couple of drinks upstairs, but you know, now we want to come down and uh, drink some good whiskey with you all, uh, you fine people. So, Andrew, before we get into some really good questions, why, if you don't care, can you lead us into our very first pour that we have up here for us? So, uh, and we actually got a little cheat sheet because we weren't sure exactly how we we're going to pour these. <laughs> yep, so, this is very uh, fancy cheat yeah, sheet. Very right fancy here. cheat sheet. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Good. So we knew. So. Tell us a little bit about our first port here. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to do a really special flight tonight of a few different Weller expressions. So Weller is, Weller is the world's original weed of bourbon. And it shares a recipe with, with Pappy. So that Pappy 15 behind the bar, um, that wheat uh, offers some approachability, some smoothness, some complexity. It's, um, it's really a great recipe ingredient. So our first pour is a special reserve. You'll find this mo the most commonly found Weller bottle, I would say. Um, and this is, we don't age state this, but it's, we target about a seven year age or so on this. But really what we're finding recently is ages are creeping up as we tar target that flavor profile. So um, great way to start. We'll work our way through a few through the course of the night, but the first one is the Special Reserve, bottled at 90 proof. Awesome, thank you, Andrew. And then, <laughs> Julina, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I think that it's a, only fair to start, as we go through a cheers, and as we cheers on this very first pour here, what, uh, why don't you walk everybody through on how you taste whiskey? Mm. <laughs> I'm, I am not sophisticated. My palate is like, I either like it or don't like it, and I know what I'm used to because my parents used to give me when I had a cough, as maybe you all did, if you had par lucky parents like, like I did, um, honey, honey, lemon, and uh, Stitzelweller bourbon whiskey made in the 50s or 60s. And, uh, and um, eventually they would take away the, or I would, the bourbon, I mean the uh, honey and the lemon, and you just had the bourbon left. Actually, my children, I think Louise is probably a victim of this. If they... Preston was born, and just to give you some history, uh, 18 months later, there were three identical triplet girls showed up um, at our doorstep. So there was four kids crying and not sleeping. So eventually I did away with the honey and the lemon and just straight 107 <laughs> proof <laughs> old rip. So anyway, but um, obviously just give it a great nose. Um, any if you, At any whiskey tasting, um, you drink it at barrel proof or whatever whatever they serve you usually from the barrel if you do a barrel pick and then you add some water to it because it opens it up it hides the uh, alcohol and you get more of the grain and the wood and so forth so it's uh it's amazing how much it changes as you add a little water to each of these whiskeys um uh, so that's why i have a little tiny ice cube in here but basically just give it a smell give it a little Roll around the tongue, the back, the sides. I know at some distilleries they tell you how to how to put the whiskey into different parts of your mouth. I'm going, wow, that's overkill on this tasting thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very very simple, and uh, just put it in your mouth and let it just drift, and then just try and concentrate on what you're tasting. And it's amazing how obviously I'm used to this type of recipe, the weeded recipe, because that's that's what our families produced for a hundred years, but. Um, uh, that's kind of my, my story, and I'm sticking to it. I, that's a good story. I'll go with it. <laughs> Who all got the Weller Special Reserve out there? Yeah, no, no, you can be loud. Go ahead. That's a good one. There you go. Anybody? Uh, if not, there, I guarantee there's more at the bar if we're not sold out yet. So what about, uh, just asking a question as we go in, what about the CYPB? All right, we got a couple. got the CYPB. All right. What about the 12-year? Oh, wow, there we go. And then we got to ask, what about the 15-year-old Pappy? Oh, come on now. Anybody we got to have a little bit more. It's all going to charity. We've got to pour some 15-year-old yeah. Pappy for charity. I'm going to keep Julian up here all night until that bottle's empty. He didn't know. It. It's only, how much is it? $75. $75 for a shot of that is $75. a bargain. You know, if you all don't use the bottle up, our host has to pay the difference. So please prevent him from having to buy the whole bottle. <laughs> that's, that's a, yeah, please. Please go use that whole bottle up. All right, so there's a whole reason that we actually chose this building the night when we were all offered. There is a, a good intertwining story with this building. And um, maybe Julian would like to start a little bit if you know uh, there's a history with you and your family and your legacy as well as Weller in this legacy. So can, can you tell us a little bit about why this building is so important for our very first one? 
I will give it a shot. Um, there are pictures um, in the archives and in the newspaper, whatever, from back in the day, taken across the street, looking at the facade of this building where it says W.L. Weller and Sons. Um, my grandfather, Pappy, grew up in Danville, Kentucky. His dad was a lawyer. His uncle was a lawyer. Uh, his uncle was Secretary of State. And he passed away, and his dad stepped into being the Secretary of State to replace his uncle. Um, so Pappy obviously did not want to be a lawyer, so he said, I'm just going to get a job. And he took his horse and buggy to Louisville and got a job with uh, W.L. Weller and Sons. And the actual original building was a block and a half down the street on the south side of the street. Um, and he worked there for Mr. Weller as a salesman. And this building was um, owned by the Bernheims, Isaac Bernheim. And you've heard that name. I believe this is the Bernheim Distillery, Bernheim Forest, and so forth. But they were in the distilling business also. So in 1890, uh, Pappy joined Mr. Weller in 1893. About 1896, Mr. Weller bought the building. This one burned down previously, and Mr. Bernheim bought it and um, just reconditioned it. And Mr. Weller bought it about 1896. So um, Pappy worked somewhere in here with looking at this beautiful window, which is freaking amazing. When you, you look at these old pictures of this place and that window is there, it's just, uh, it's incredible. So I'm glad they, when they redid this place and kept all of the uh, ambiance and the architecture around, everything you see was pretty much here back in the day. So he, he worked here and Alex Farnsley was his partner who was a salesman also. And eventually they became partners in this firm with Mr. Weller. And after Prohibition, built the distillery in, in uh, Shively, just south of here in uh, 1935, opened up Stitzel Weller Derby Day in 1935. So the rest is history, as they say. Yeah, and this is really <coughs> important if we know that this is Whiskey Row. And the whole point was really getting down here and getting as close to the Ohio River as we possibly could to get barrels on those steamboats to get this whiskey everywhere. So this was where you wanted to be. Um, in the whiskey business. Yeah, it's amazing that it's all, of course, most rivers, obviously, the city's built up, but the, the barrels are gravity-wise, the barrels weigh, you know, three or four or 500 pounds. So just roll them down to the riverboat and ship them on out of here. So that's why um, after Prohibition, Whiskey Row kind of went away because there was these things called trucks, and you could just put them on a truck and haul them all over the country where the riverboat was, you know, just down by the river. So um, that's... That's, uh, it was a, that's why this was all Whiskey Row, and there are probably 40 different distillery offices on Main Street, all the way from two or three blocks that way, all the way down to, say, probably uh, 7th or 9th Street. Now, we do have to bring in the, the funny history of this building, too, just a little bit. We oh, talked yeah. about it upstairs. Uh, does anybody remember what this, I don't know, what did we say, 70s or so, 80s? Mm. Do you only remember what this area was? I don't I was a young boy. I don't yeah. know anything about that. Nothing, nothing about what was down here? If you guys don't know a little bit about this building, there was a... Uh, some interesting clubs that went on in here in Whiskey Row by around the 70s. We weren't really making whiskey, but there were, there were a lot of clubs about two stories down below us here. Uh, we're not gonna get into all of that tonight, but if you wanna research it, I'm pretty sure you can probably find it out. Uh, it was a lot of fun, but you know, Julian knows nothing about it. He was never down here, so. <coughs> he was, you're already in the new distillery moving on, right? That's right. <laughs> Some type of ladies, ladies of the evening or something like that. The <laughs> several, there several several buildings. I think there's yeah. a couple different names there. Whatever it takes. So tell us, the um, how's being a part of that Van Winkle bourbon legacy influenced your approach on the whole entire industry? Well, you, 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 you preach what you know. And like I said, when I was a kid, I, I grew up on this flavor profile. So we have tried to keep that. And Buffalo Trace has nailed it with our new production. We started with them in 2022. So it's been a... It's been a 20 plus year relationship with them. And, and Harlan Wheatley has is, is been making Weller, they bought the uh, Sazerac, our partners, Buffalo Trace, bought the Weller label in 1999. And um, with that, some barrels from Stitzel Weller. And, but the weeded formula, uh, Harlan has nailed it. And uh, in the book, Pappy Land, oh, I should, I should have that book up here so I could yeah, have a prop because yeah. I actually have something Maybe to sell. Listen, we can go ahead and grab one. We got one upstairs if somebody wants to bring Pappy Land uh, down But here. it talks about how proud I was that uh, we tasted the 15-year in the, in the, in the lab uh, before we bottled it as a Pappy Van Winkle label, and it was, it was stunning. So we're, that's, that's what you all could enjoy tonight for only $75. Okay. But um, it's, it's, it's kind of inbred in us, the, the, 
the flavor profile, the Van Winkle, um, what we do, it's, it, the, Pappy had a plaque on the, his distillery wall out front on the limestone lane. It said, um, we make fine bourbon and a profit if we can, a loss if we must, but always fine bourbon. So we focus on quality versus making a bunch of money, which is stockholder driven. We have stockholders, but you're looking at most of them, a couple of them, two or three of them right here. And they're only, you know, they're not, there are six of us so that owns this brand. So um, uh, along with our partner, Sazerac. So it's, um, uh, we're, not, we're not trying to make money and you can, lots of distilleries out there over the years have made whiskey less expensively. And I think you've noticed that the quality of the whiskey may have gone down through the years. Um, but at, we, don't, we don't worry about that part. It's all about quality, so um, that's what we focus on. Yeah, and, and so to this day, if you visit, you know, Warehouse A at Buffalo Trace Distillery, walk just across Catacorn or to it is what's been named the Weller & Sons building, and that, um, I believe, a replica of that plaque sits there. It's no, it's the Dallas. original. It is the original. Oh, wow. So you can go don't see... Don't tell anybody. Diageo, no, they gave it to me, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> no one's here. No one's listening here. Wink. <laughs> so, Andrew, tell us a little bit, I definitely don't want to leave you out, but I mean, Andrew, as we talk, we got Julia up here. But tell us a little bit about your job as the uh, director of American and Indian Whiskey there for Sazerac. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, the, the, nobody cares too much about the job itself, I'm sure. I don't want to bore you with that, but, it, you know, we're, we're very proud to have a pretty stunning portfolio of over 50 brands. Um, that come out of Buffalo Trace Distillery and, and the various other Sazerac distilleries. So that would include Barton 1792, that would include A. Smith Bowman out in Virginia. So really my role is more of a, it, it says brand director, but really it's storyteller, right? I'm a steward of the stories that came before us and my team works on making sure the stories like the Van Winkle story and the Weller story and all of those, anybody that digs into bourbon history quite a bit finds it all traces back to a few a few individuals and a few families and stems out from there. So there is a certain responsibility for that, of like telling that story to the next generation. And ultimately what we want is to get more people loving whiskey, right? And if they do that, they eventually find these brands. And, and we're starting here where this, you know, whiskey kind of really uh, you know, became a lore right here with uh, Weller and Son and Pappy Van Winkle just right here. So. Julian, I got a good old question for you. Um, this is one that I was really, when I went through, uh, you know, Red Pappy Land and uh, did a lot more research into you, I had my biggest question for Julian over everything that I wrote down. So if you don't know a lot, Julian left uh, selling clothing back in the 70s, is that right? I did. No. Yep. I was then, scared of my father, so I didn't want to go work for him. So that's where my question was. So you, He was a captain in the, in the army, and he drove a tank. And he just like kind of barreled it over everybody? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so why did you decide you leave clothing and it's the 70s and, you know, the 80s? Why did you decide to do whiskey? Um, because, I mean, to me, it doesn't seem about that time period. I mean, it was really about like the decanters and not many people were drinking as much. It seems like a lot of people might have said that might not have been the smartest move to, to join in and get into the whiskey industry. Why did, why did you, why'd you do it? Thanks a lot for... You're welcome. For was, that the, yeah, compl absolutely. backhanded compliment. Uh, absolutely, you're welcome. That's what I do. You signed um, up for this, Julian. No, I, um, I, I got a job in a clothing store. Rhodes Rapier was the name of the store down on uh, 4th and Walnut, Muhammad Ali back in the day. And um, uh, as I said, I didn't get out, get out of college. I didn't want to work for my dad right away. And um, so I got a job in a clothing store. And eventually, after, let's see, about four years, around 1977, I got a promotion to be a possible buyer if I wanted to go buy to New York or wherever and buy clothes for the store. And I'm going, oh my God, <laughs> it's bad enough sitting there selling clothes on a Saturday afternoon when UK is playing basketball or, or football or something like that. Um, so I said, well, thanks for that. I'll, uh, hey. So Preston was born, and uh, my wife Sissy just reminded me the other day that that's when my father asked my wife, do you think Julian would want to work for me? And she remembered because Preston had just been born. He'd come home in 1977. And uh, she said, I don't know. Why don't you ask him? <laughs> so he did ask me, and I said yes. But um, I didn't know whether the Bourbon Menace was, you know, I didn't have a clue. It was, uh, we had just sold the distillery five years previously, Stitzelweller, and Dad had started this new brand of old Rip Van Winkle, and the decanter business was was popular because you didn't, you didn't, nobody cared about the bourbon, they cared about the decanters the bourbon went into. 
Now, if you find these decanters, you throw away the decanter, but the whiskey's wonderful. So it's uh, people are, people don't you know it's all about in the mind. But um, I started working for Dad then, and um, glad I did because it turned out okay. But it was not easy all these years. But um, yeah, it was. Um, we had a fun time. He only he only lived for uh, till 1981, and uh, so I had to learn the business in four years. <laughs> what did and you it didn't work out that well. What did you know about whiskey when you went into it with, it with your dad? How much did you know of it? Um, I I'd, I'd, I'd met some people in the because I worked at the distillery in the summer times, either uh, coopering barrels, working in the warehouse, the Case Good Warehouse, the distillery, every aspect through the summers. Um, and then and also went on some sales trips with him to see kind of how it works. So that was that was interesting to me. So I was I was glad to kind of get that little piece of the action. So it was um, it was fortunate that I got to do that. And then he hired me and um, um, got a little piece, just enough to to get by, so to speak. But what he did was had a great dis group of distributors that were selling our small old ribbonicle limited edition, limited, because no, not that many people were buying it, because um, we were able to buy Stitzeweller barrels after we sold the distillery, which is very fortunate, because um, they, back then, it was called excess whiskey. Can you imagine that, having, having too much Stitzeweller barrels before? <laughs> excess whiskey. Um, so it was- You uh, don't have that problem anymore, do you? Well, no, nobody does that makes <laughs> decent whiskey. <laughs> So I was really lucky to do that, but uh, it, um, it, was, it was fun and we had a great time. And um, uh, so then it was just turned into um, the decanter business from the 70s and through the 80s almost. But the whiskey part, I focused on when the decanters got to be $50 a bottle retail, that was kind of the cutoff spot. That was like Joe customer said, I'm not gonna buy any more of these decanters because it's over $14.99. So that's when I focused on selling the bottle of whiskey instead of just the decanter. So, um, and then things started to, started to improve after that. And so you said you went, uh, you know, in the summers you were working with your dad and things like that, and then you, you got hired on. What was your first job when you were um, hired on? Was it sales or? You mean working for dad? And yeah, like, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, like, not sales. Just going up for free. No, go, for free, uh, go free to labor. the liquor stores with your picture or the actual decanter of a f duck hunter or a coal miner or a, you know, a lumberjack or whatever, and also a bottle of our old Rip Van Winkle. So um, it was tough. And there's bottles, you know, back when the, um, you know, the, there was not a big popularity still in bourbon, there was still the decanters, is what we were selling, which is a tough sell. I mean, you go to Pat's Steakhouse on Brownsboro Road down the street. I saw an article in Voice magazine yesterday about Pat's Steakhouse, how long it's been around forever. And um, all these Irish decanters are all around the, the building in there. And that's what we sold back then. Was But it was I good. I they're all empty now. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> if not, they're worth a fortune. But uh, it was it was fun. You get a lot of turn downs. You know, like it's to, you know it is in a sales job. You, it's not all roses. It, it's tough sometimes. So. Um, Got a lot of uh, not going to go in there, and I don't want this kid's bottle. And get out, get out of here. And it cost it cost how much? Six dollars. Six you know. dollars for whiskey. <laughs> so it was a tough sell, but it was just uh, learn about uh, the pricing of bourbon, and you know, get the cost of everything, and how you how you how you do it. Now that's all kind of done for us. Thanks. Thanks to these guys. <laughs> they do the heavy lifting, but uh, we did put our time in. That's Preston and I did put our time in uh, trying to figure this job out back in the day. And we're going to get into that, too. So. Okay. But we got to go into our next pour here. So Andrew. All right. So first off, who out there had CYPB? Raise it if yeah, you got Yeah, there the we CYPB. go. All right. Okay. And I'm curious about this. So this was CYPB was sort of a first. Did anybody in this room vote for CYPB? before it was bought. Got one. All right, so we've got a few folks who know the story, so I'll tell it. CYPB, what a strange name for a bourbon. Who would come up with that? Well, it stands for Craft Your Perfect Bourbon. And interestingly, uh, what we did was, it was basically an early version of crowdsourcing. So we allowed, there was a website that allowed folks to enter things like recipe, proof, what have you. What would be your perfect bourbon? And in what was probably a little bit of an indicator on why Pappy Van Winkle and Weller are so popular is that they selected a weeded bourbon as their ideal perfect bourbon. So anyways, this is the result of that. So we actually- Jeez, imagine that. Imagine that. 
So we took that all into consideration, actually made that bourbon, bottled it, and released it as Weller CYPV. So this is the result of that. It is a weeded recipe. Um, and it, it is bottled at a little higher proof uh, than the Special Reserves. This is bottled at 95 proof. So if you've got the CYPV, and especially if you voted, thanks for that. It is one of my very favorite bottles in our entire lineup, and I hope you enjoy it. Mm. Gotta take a sip of that. It's tasty. And it's oh. extremely tasty. Look what I just put in there, a twist of lemon. Yeah, you put the twist of lemon. Just so <laughs> Preston can tell his story if he wants to about the New York bar. This is actually, yeah, this is a perfect time. Preston, you wanna come over here and grab a mic real quick? So, if anybody has ever read Pappy Land or heard the audiobook or anything like that, there is an amazing, an amazing story. story. Here, actually, we want to show it right here. Yeah, we there you go. We didn't even tell Preston what he was going to talk about yet. <laughs> so, if you guys haven't seen this, please pick up a copy of Pappy Land. Absolutely fantastic by Wright Thompson. A really, really great book. But if you have not heard this yet, so in this book, we get to hear uh, a little bit, I'd like to call it a mic drop moment, probably a little <laughs> bit by you. So Preston, you were in a bar, uh, you were in a bar in New York, if I remember correctly, was that, is that Colorado. Right? Colorado. And you went to order, uh, why don't you tell us what you ordered and how it went, there you go. Uh, yeah, so this, uh, this is, it's happened a, a few times, but this is kind of, an amalgamation of all the different occurrences, but uh, this particular story is about as close as to as close as I could get to exactly what happened. So I um, I had seen a bottle of uh, of the old rib, ten year old <coughs> ten year old old rib on the bar at this restaurant the night before. It was out of, uh, in Breckenridge on a a guy's ski trip with a bunch of buddies, and um, everybody was kind of dragging their feet, getting ready. So I went ahead and went down to the down to this place early uh, to meet the the bar staff and introduce myself and thank them for carrying our products and whatnot. So I, I walk in, sit down at the bar. The place is relatively empty at this point, and I ordered a, an old rip on the rocks with a splash and a twist. And the bartender looked at me sideways and goes, oh, I don't think I can do that. I don't think I can serve it to you like that. Pappy would probably roll over in his grave. Um, so I just kind of chuckled and said, okay, well, um, he said, I can give you all of those parts and you can mix it together if you want. I said, okay, that'd be fine. Um, so get the drink, mix it together myself, and uh, sat there for probably 10 or 15 minutes, chatting with the bartender, uh, bar manager. Didn't introduce myself at that point. Um, you know, watching, I think the NBA was on, watching a game, and I noticed my friends walk in, so I went to settle up my tab to go to our table, and I handed the bartender my credit card, and he ran, went over towards the kitchen where the cash register was and started running the card. And he calls his manager over and he dis the bartender disappeared back into the kitchen. And the bar manager brought me uh, my card back and said, oh, Mr. Van Winkle, I'm very sorry about the experience you just had. Um, you know, drinks on us, is a, you know, no big deal, I get it, uh, there's a lot of you know, a lot of people have opinions on the way it should be consumed, and our theory is you should drink it the way you like it. You, you know, it's your drink, you bought it, uh, drink it however you want. Not to say that I would suggest mixing it with ginger ale and Coke. But, um, but if, if you went to the trouble of buying a bottle, you, you know, it's yours to do with as you please. Um, you know, you can take a shower in it if you want, I don't care. Um, but uh, anyway, so um, yeah, I, I just thought it was pretty funny. So the, uh, the bartender did come back over and apologize, and I explained to him that not only was that the way that Pappy drank his bourbon, so uh, my grandfather did as well, my father does, and I uh, <laughs> did as well. So, you know, learned behavior. Um, so a lot of apologies. Um, we went actually back to that place the next night again. Uh, it was kind of a good after hours hangout, after dinner place to hang out. And that bartender, rather than being behind the bar, 
was sitting outside checking IDs in 11 degree weather. <laughs> <and snowstorm. laughs> Uh, so, I guess if there are any more to that story, just, uh, you know, just give the people what they want. Here you go. Well Thank said. you so much, Preston. That was great. Well so, there I go. I got a twist of lemon. So, that's going to lead me into the next question, which I didn't even have on here. But in the book, too, there was a moment where you've actually had something similar happen like that, where you've actually ordered one of, one of your one of your bottles before, mm -hmm. and um, it actually came out, and it wasn't Patrick Van Winkle in the bottle. Well, that was actually a son-in-law. Oh, okay, son-in-law. I and mean, he's got a palate probably better than I do, but um, this is my daughter Chenault's husband. But he was in, I think he was in Breckenridge, actually. That's a bad place to drink whiskey, <laughs> yeah, Breckenridge, Colorado. Breckenridge. Uh, um, but he was there, and, and, and you all ever heard of something called funneling? It's illegal, it's where you, you buy a bottle of really nice whiskey, then you, you sell it all, then you go fill it up with something else that's not quite as fine. So they must have done that because my son-in-law tasted it. And um, this was several years ago, so he had only known our family for you know just a few years, but he uh, had developed a, a, a flavor profile that he was familiar with, our whiskey. This was not it. It almost tasted like scotch, he said. So um, he, he said to the bartender, come on over. I think uh, I have a question. Do you have... Um, any idea what's in this bottle? Because it's not Van Winkle whiskey. So the guy went back and let me go check my manager or whatever. And the guy never showed up again. And uh, nobody in the whole, anybody that he had seen previously behind the bar had all disappeared. So some other people showed up. So obviously they were busted, but uh, it does happen. But uh, he got, he called him out on it. And um, which is, sometimes I'm scared to do that because, you know, whatever. But um, it happens. It probably happens a whole lot these days. I don't know if y'all have had any experience with that. Probably so. Well, we were talking about this upstairs before we came down, but it's kind of related to we'll get requests more than once a week at Buffalo Trace on mm. verifying Pappy bottles or verifying Weller bottles or antique collection and what have you, and we find a lot of fakes. That's why we really encourage people not to buy on the secondary market and to buy through proper channels because you I mean, just don't know. One, you'd say it's probably one of the most... Um, yeah. You know, counterfeited bottle of the, bottles in the world. It's a million dollar deal out there. It is, and you've ever had so, if you've ever had the um, privilege of being able to share a bottle with Preston or share a bottle with Julian, one of the things that will always happen, especially if it's your bottle or anything, I've, I've noticed this is the very first time I ever had a drink with Preston. Preston immediately just kind of grabs the bottle, we're all having a great time, we're drinking, he grabs it, he just pulls a key out of his pocket, and he pretty much just kind of <laughs> scores across the label. And it's pretty much to make sure that that bottle doesn't get back out there and gets filled with something else. So I actually have uh, picked up that even with my bottles at home. I immediately went, went through and scored them. If I ever empty them, which I don't know when it'll be, but if I ever get there, it won't be filled. <laughs> Blowtorch? Who did that? Ryan did. Yeah. Blowtorch? Just a head little Instagram thing. Butane oh, torch. Butane Same torch. thing. They're so good and good, you can't break them. Can you tell us more about these proper channels? One of the most proper Hopefully channels a is actually behind the bar tonight. You can yeah. have a pour of Pappy Van Winkle 15. Way to go, Andrew. Right. That's why we aren't taking requests from the audience. <laughs> Don't buy anything on the internet, because they are not, number one, licensed to sell alcohol. Number two, you never know where it comes from, because it's very easy to counterfeit these bottles. I mean, that, eBay, you see a bottle on eBay, there are these stories that are numbered, some of our bottles were numbered. Okay, there's 23 year old, it's got number C41 on there and all of a sudden it's full the next week. Hmm, how did they fill that bottle up with the same label number? So it's pretty obvious. I'll just leave it at, people think we don't watch the sites and we don't see the fakes and I think that's an incorrect assumption. So we see it all. Can I ask both of your all's opinion on this? And Preston, you could even weigh in too. What do you think about some of those markups that you see out there? Like, you already put out like an exceptional, great, fine bourbon at a really, really fair price. What do you think about when you're seeing those type of black market prices where it's $3,000 a bottle? And, it, and it's not that we're raising Dare to Care or you know, a charity behind it. But what are your just thoughts on, on markups on whiskey? Or well, I think if really we price the the whiskeys 
according to what we think they're worth based on their quality and their age and all the things that go into it. So I think one thing that, ha that happens with that is we can't control the secondary pricing, right? We're in a three-tier system in the U.S. and uh, people have a right to price where they want. But it does introduce, sometimes you get a whiskey that's been priced up so much that it's not really meant to be that price and you see people judge it accordingly, right? And that's where it starts to be sort of a problem. If it's if it's supposed to be a $69 bottle, but it's being sold for $199, it's not gonna compare favorably to bottles that are supposed to be $199 or worse. So I think that is one factor. So that's why we encourage people, and I think we're, we're pretty united on this, but it's meant for drinking, right? It's meant to be open and shared with friends. That was actually so, be my next question. Right. Like, Julian, like, you didn't make it to collect it. Like, you made it to be consumed, right? Yes, we do not make this to sit on your shelf and look at it and show your friends bottles and bottles and bottles of, of, of different whiskeys from all over the, all over the country. Um, we make it to enjoy it. Uh, some of this book is about, and we've had, I've had a lot of, I've got a stack of letters from people who read it. And it's a lot of, it's more about father and son relationship versus about the whiskey business. Um, business, sorry. Uh, quit saying business, my wife says, quit saying business. Sorry, I'm from Kentucky. <laughs> um, but it's, it's more about the, the, the family relationships, and, uh, and sh we make this to share. So it's incredible. And Freddie Johnson at, at Buffalo Trace, I mean, his, his, when he gets um, uh, on his, his little documentary, I can't remember what's it, I don't know if it's uh, neat. neat. Was that Neat? neat. Yeah, the, the, the bourbon documentary, Neat, which is really cool. Freddie's on there. Who's a, he's a collector's item. This guy is third generation Buffalo Trace employee um i mean he's he's what so he, you call him a collector's item he is him yeah he put <laughs> yeah you put him <laughs> at least he can talk about if you've him. never had a tour from oh, him he knows so much about this uh, business just keep going back until you get freddie because uh there and then once you do it it's gonna every tour after that's really gonna go downhill yeah. um he's, he's absolutely he's he is incredible. But he talked about, you know, he got a bottle of our 20 year or something went right before his dad died and sat down and got to enjoy it with him. And hell, that's what it's all about. That's what this whiskey is all about is to enjoy with your friends. So just keep that in mind. Tell all your friends that have all those collectibles on their shelf to drink them. <laughs> Andrew, because we want to make sure we introduce every single before, before, before time runs out. What's our next one, man? Okay, that's a good segue, actually. So next up is Weller 12 year. Anybody got Weller 12 year? Okay. A little now? bit more. I know a couple more people. Does anybody have Weller 12 year? Thank you very That's much. That's better. So there much we go. better. Don't be dying out there on me. If we got to, we're, we're going to keep this going all day until that Pappy bottle's gone. We got to raise money. <laughs> That's our whole goal here, right? Right, Julian? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So this is a look. This is an outstanding whiskey in its own right. But do we? Are there any yellow? Uh, any Yellowstone fans in the house? <laughs> so I think. We, are, we were pretty excited to see this bottle show up in the Dutton's limo, if anybody remembers that famous episode in, in, in Beth Dutton's Oh, you're talking about Yellowstone the show. Yellowstone <laughs> you the thought show. they were talking about the whiskey. <laughs> we won't talk about Yellowstone the whiskey tonight, but we're talking about the show. Um, so we were excited to see that being sort of the choice of Beth Dutton, which if I were going to pick a character from the show, that's a good one Whew. for Weller 12. So um, one thing we were just talking about is it's meant, the whiskey's meant for sharing. One of the things we love to do, especially with an age-stated whiskey, is if you've got it right now, think about what you were doing 12 years ago. So 12 years ago would have been 2011, and you probably have a pretty vivid memory right now of maybe what you were doing at that time or who you were with, and that's kind of why we encourage folks to drink the bottles instead of letting them um, sit on the shelf. So when you open the 12 year or when you taste this, Think a little bit about what you might have been doing in 2011 or who you were with or what stage of that life you're in. And, and as you drink the whiskey, you'll think about that. And next time you taste well or 12 again, you'll think about this night when you got to taste it with all of us. So cheers. Uh, well or 12 next. Cheers, everybody. Woo. Is there anybody out there that this is your first time ever having well or 12? We got one. What do you think? It's good, man. it's delicious. So, Julian or Preston, Andrew, anybody can, I think can answer this. What is that difference? So we talked about the mash bill a little bit earlier about it being weeded. This is a Weller 12 here. We do have 
um, Van Winkle 12 and stuff like that. What is that big difference? Is it the same mash bill? Is it a little different? Uh, can, what can you tell us? Let's say it that way. It's, Rob, it, go ahead. Yeah. It's, um, it's the same mash bill. Um, we could make a few tweaks here and there if we wanted to, but we haven't at this point. So basically, we taste every barrel before we bottle it. Uh, Weller is a bigger brand. Um, still hard to find because the demand is so big, but um, they, they, they dump all the barrels together without tasting every single barrel. Um, sometimes the, the Weller 12 may be a little better than the Van Winkle 12. You just never know. But um, And that's course very subjective um, but it's it we do taste every barrel and we're not it's not when I taste barrels it's not what we're looking for it's what we're not looking for it taste something that's off so kick that barrel out age it further it may it may turn out okay down the road to be 15 or 20 or 23 or could be ancient age three-year-old someday if it's really never never matures but uh, we do taste every barrel so it's a specific flavor profile we're looking for yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. We get the question a lot on mash bill, and people focus on the mash bill for good reason, because it is a big determinant of how the whiskey tastes, but there are a lot of other levers, right? There's proof, there's aging location, uh, there's even spot, the, the specific warehouse, there's even the spot in the warehouse, right? Which floor of the warehouse, which, which floor it was aged on matters a whole lot. So that's why you will get a lot of different flavor profiles even in the same mash bill and the same age in the case of Pappy Van Winkle 12 versus Weller 12. And really, just like Julian says, it's about there are different flavor profiles for each brand that we're looking for. And that's necessarily and sort I mean, why you can't like just take that recipe and just go down the street and make it. It's going to taste exactly like right. Van Winkle 12. Um, no matter what Preston told me I'm making at home, it's probably not going to taste like it in 12 years. I probably wasted my time with you, I guess. <laughs> So I got a good question talking about the picking between the two. Do you guys pick, are you guys tasting at the same time? Sometimes. Sometimes, sometimes I'll show up, sometimes he'll show up. Sometimes how, together. How often is it that you all agree on certain things? What is that process of you guys agreeing to, like from the time you're tasting to the time we say, this is what we're gonna get in the bottle. How is that partnership between the both of you all during that? Is there a lot of agreement? You guys both are just fans up? Or is, has there ever been the arguments? It's, Rarely. he's, Preston has, he's got a younger palate than I do. Can you believe that? Um, <laughs> which means it's a little more fresh. And, um, uh, you know, my nose is, I took, took some pain, whatever that stuff is that makes you get a cold. Oh. You, what's that starts with a C or whatever. What's it called? Zycam. Oh, see, there we go. Like, I put some swabs in my nose one time, and I think it killed a bunch of my nasal smellers or whatever. But um, basically, we're we're on the same page a lot. He can pick up a whole lot more no, lot more notes than I can. But it's basically um, again a flavor profile that kind of is bred and in, bred in us that we're familiar with, and that's what we enjoy. If we don't uh, we don't see that as something off whether it's a, a piece of the stave has got too much of the sapwood in it versus the heartwood, it's not gonna age correctly. And um, Andrew was talking about um, barrel different, the barrel warehouse differences. I'll just mention that I'm really into wine. I'm more interested in wine and whiskey sometimes because there's so many variables as how the wine can change and how it's different from one bottle to the next. Um, the, the warehouse is really our terroir because different parts of the warehouse, depending on the construction, can produce a completely different whiskey. If it's not my, I think I'm right, that Buffalo Trace and Eagle Rare are the same mash bill, same whiskey, but they produce, they're aged in different warehousing. Totally different whiskey, it's crazy. That's true, yeah, completely different. And, and you see that come up, the terroir discussion related to the warehouse shows up um, on, on Blanton's, for instance, right? Where Warehouse H is a metal side warehouse and it exhibits different it transfers heat differently than the brick exterior, things of that nature. So it, it matters a whole lot, and that's why even on the same distillery site, you can put the same mash bill in the same type of barrel with the same char at the bottle at the same proof and get a much different flavor profile at the end when you go to bottle it. So thank you for explaining that. And it kind of leads into my question of, you know, Julian with the sell of the family's distillery back in the 70s and things like that, we get into the early 2000s, um, you, you have this great bottle, you've kind of started to rebuild this legacy a little bit. Was it a hard decision to say I wanted to partner with like Buffalo Trace to start doing this? Like, 
I mean, just knowing the past and knowing, like, could this be where the family legacy goes away again? Was that something that you thought about? Or was it like they, they you thought that they could really get behind you and help develop this? Good question. Um, I'll be honest with you. When um, Chris McCroy, who was a Buffalo Trace back in 2001, approached me uh, via Mark Brown, who was the president and CEO, um, came to me saying, would you like to be partner up with us and do a, a JV? I don't even know what a JV was. A junior varsity? Because um, I never had to do a joint venture with anyone. But I said, nah, it's a great thought, but I, I really, I've been working by myself since 1981. And Preston joined me in 2001 after he graduated from college the day after I had him started helping me in Lawrenceburg. So I didn't, originally I did not think about it, but then I thought about, well, the bourbon business is getting more popular. It's getting harder to buy the barrels that I want, which were all Stitzel Weller back then. And other people were starting to notice that Stitzel Weller was a very, very good whiskey and they started Jefferson's Reserve and very old St. Nick and who knows, probably Max Shapira at Heaven Hill were buying back barrels from Stitzel Weller. So it was getting harder to find the barrels and I knew, well, gee, I'm not making you whiskey for the future. So a few months later, I got smartened up and said, look, these people own Weller. They got it down, the whiskey's good. Um, their facility was a little rough back then. Uh, it was, they'd only owned it for, I think, uh, Bill Goldring bought um, set, uh, the Ancient Age Distillery in 1996, I believe. So, but it was still something that I needed to produce whiskey for the future. And I could see the bourbon business was getting more popular and barrels were getting in short supply. So finally smart, smartened up and said, yeah, let's do this. So yeah, thank, thank God they knocked on my door. Otherwise, <laughs> I'd go back to selling clothes. But something. then that next scary part of it, so you agree, but then you have to wait 10, 15 years to figure out if what you remember from the past is going to be in that bottle 15 years later. What is it like sitting at that table for that very first time tasting what could have been a, a, the worst decision that you made with that van or, or phenomenal? What was that like just sitting down there where was it everything was on the table? It was a leap of faith for sure because when we hooked up with them, they had not produced any Weller that we had tasted because uh, Buffalo Trace was able to buy old Stitzel Weller barrels and um, I had in the past, so it was a leap of faith, but um, I knew the distillery was good and we had faith in Harlan Wheatley. And um, again, when as I mentioned in the book with Wright Thompson, we, we sat down at the lab table and tasted the 15 year wait way down the road that was made by Buffalo Trace and it was exceptional. So um, we, we made the right decision for once. Yeah. And what was the family like from Preston to the children and stuff like that of making this like total change? I mean, Preston, you were with the company then at that point in time, right? So what was your, were you like really behind it and let's go and that same feeling of you sitting down there and tasting the, the first time that your family's name is gonna be on this bottle? And, I remember walking into the lab and this was, I remember when we walked into the lab that day to taste the, the first 15 year old that Harlan had made and it was um, you know it's kind of like walking on um, one of those nail board uh, carnival sideshow things um, it was you know we were terrified and excited all at the same time and we both took the first sip of rank, you know, some random sample off the off the tables in the lab and we looked at each other and it was kind of like, oh, okay, I think we got this. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, you know, it was like winning the Super Bowl or I guess. Um, uh, Without all the rings and money. <laughs> yeah, right. And Taylor Swift. And uh, Taylor Swift, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but no, it was amazing. So, it, you know, thank goodness for Harlan. Um, and, you know, obviously, Dad made the right choice uh, when he did. And, um, we spent a lot of time working with the folks at Buffalo Trace, um, you know, talking about the recipe and the aging and our expectations. And there was no pushback on any of it. Uh, really at all, so uh, 
that was a, a nice feeling as well going into it. And then you know, you know, here I am right out of college selling whiskey that I was the same age as. Um, you know, I'd never, I'd never been in a horror room atmosphere. He mentioned you know, the whole term JV. You know, I'd never been in a horror room other than you know in college in a you know mock horror room sort of uh, situation. But um, yeah, it, it, it's worked out pretty well in our favor, I'd say. <laughs> I'd say so. Yeah. And theirs as well. <laughs> Thank you, Preston. Andrew. Let's finish it off with one last pour and a couple more little fun questions. So tell us about the very last pour that we have in front of us. Okay, how many in the audience have the Weller Full Proof? There All we right. go. So hold on a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There you go, Andrew. I think the 12-year folks were heard across the street. I think the Full Proof <laughs> folks, but by the way, it's higher proof, it's really like outgoing whiskey. I don't think that matches. So who's got the Full Proof? Yeah. There we go. There we go. I got a couple people over there that's got a foolproof. So what is the proof of the foolproof? Right, so foolproof, what does that mean? All right, well, so this is the, okay, this is the weeded mash bill again, same mash bill we've been tasting all night, but now we're playing with the proof instead of age or any other lip butter. So by foolproof, we mean the same proof, the same entry proof as when it went into the barrel, which is 114 proof. So this is kind of ending the uh, ending the tasting flight on a high note here, but it's 114 proof, and I would say we hear a lot of feedback that it might be 114 proof, but it doesn't drink like it. That's just that perfect balance that's going on in the whiskey, and the, the weeded recipe does kind of soften things a bit. Um, but really, explosion in flavors, um, great nose in this one, but if you taste a little bit of oiliness in it, that's a little bit of barrel coming through, and um, this is probably the boldest expression, short of William LaRue Weller, that you can taste in this lineup. It's got a beautiful, just like, nice tang on the mid palate, like it's very I mean, full flavored, yeah. nice viscosity to it, just really well-rounded, weed and whiskey. Yeah. Beautiful. beautiful. So it leads me, and Preston, I gotta bring you back in on this question too. So out of both lines, all right, so we're not gonna pick just one. Out of just the Van Winkle line and the Weller line, what is your favorite, if you have them all sitting in front of you, what's your absolute favorite go-to pour out of everything on this, and one from each line? I'll start with Julian. Start with Van Winkle. That Weller four, that 114 is pretty good. I, I don't enjoy that or get to enjoy it a whole lot, although my, I have a couple of friends who've given me some of their barrel picks. Boy, that's good. I, you would, normally it would be. I have a couple of friends who've given his barrel picks and breasts. <laughs> son in law and, and son, but um, 12 year would normally be, but that's, that's really great. But otherwise, for ours, is 15 year. I mean, it's, 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 Balance. It's not too woody. It's not. It's obviously got more complexity. It's got those citrus notes. If that's something that's in, it's in the whiskey that, that I enjoy, and that makes a hell of an old fashioned. Oh, you mix your drink. You gonna? Is that a next question? Yeah, yeah. you can go into whatever you want to. No, but I just enjoy the 15 years. Just, um, uh, just my right favorite. in my right in my wheelhouse. And I do have to. I, I, I'll admit, I put some ice, some really nice clear ice cubes in there. And um, cold ice, cold ice, all ice is cold. No, if you've got ice cubes that's white, it's got an air in it and it's not very cold. Um, I've become an ice knob in the last 20 something years. But it does make a difference. <laughs> it does. And actually, I learned this from uh, this, this girl right down here. Uh, she taught me a little bit at Bourbon and Beyond last year uh, about how important ice is to cocktails, especially right. your ice. So uh, it is yeah. really But 15 years is my, my favorite. Yep. Andrew? Yeah, so I swear they didn't feed us the answers ahead of time, but I, I will say when I had the opportunity to pick a barrel for my own group and pick any Weller expression, it was, I did have it bottled as full proof. I do think it's the most pure expression of Weller at that proof. You really get the full flavor. You get everything that's going on complexity-wise with that whiskey. Um, also have to say in the Van Winkle lineup, I am also in the camp of 15. I mean, there are some 12s that some years that really give it a run for its money. But I do find that 15 to just be unbelievably balanced. Not too much barrel, not too much smoke, but just enough that you get a lot of complexity and you really 
I've, I've always agreed that to me that 15 has always been. Because sometimes I get too too oaky when you get into the 20 and 23s. No, for me my too. Talent. Yeah. But man, 15 is so well balanced. Just well balanced, beautiful whistle. All right, Preston. It's you, man. I'm right there in line, the 15 year Pappy. Um, it's, just, it's the most versatile, versatile of our bourbons. Um, and, you know, growing up, I literally cut my teeth on higher proof bourbon, so um, I appreciate the. Uh, cough medicine. Yeah. You know, that's <laughs> really. You could buy in a store called Cough Medicine until I was probably 10 or 12. Uh, but yeah, the, the 15 year old Pappy is just a, amazing. I've got some up the bar. Um, <laughs> good calls. Uh, and then until the full proof came out, I would have said the, the antique, uh, the 107 proof. Because that really is kind of what, um, yeah, that's what, that's what we had around the house. It was, it was just old Rip Van Winkle at that point. Um, but the 107 proof, seven year old, um, that, you know, really, that that's the most, I'm most familiar with that age and that proof. Uh, but until the full proof came out, I would have said the antique, but now that the full proof's out there. Um, I got to do a barrel um, with a couple of my brothers-in-law and uh, a buddy, and uh, we did one antique and one full proof, and, uh, you know, a few years apart, but that full proof, man, it, um, yeah. Uh, I had a lot of friends knocking on the door um, <laughs> once. So. Yeah, I tried to knock too, and Preston wouldn't call me back. <laughs> so lost I'm your number. Still, still waiting on the text message back, Preston. <laughs> so I guess you could say we we all have sort of a house palette up here. Yes, we do. So I do. Let, let's ask the audience real fast. So out of so we're gonna ask the whole audience to just yell it out. What is your favorite out of the Van Winkle lineup? Just yell the year. 12, we got, we got a 12, 20. I think we heard a majority of 15. 20, 20. 20, absolutely. All right, now what about, what's that? Yeah. Ooh. I love the riot. The riot, the riot. Riot's good, you know what the riot here is? 13 year riot, 13 year riot. 13 year riot. It could be 15, but it's 13. Do I look like I know that's all right. You're good. <laughs> all right. And what about the Weller line? What would you say your favorite one? Just yell out the expression. Man, that was all across the board. That was a lot. That was all over the place. I think Nothing people like was everywhere. I think people just like, I like I think people just like Weller all across the board. That's it. Julian, to kind of close us out, um, I thought I'd leave you one really good question I'd like to say. Looking back at your whole career, what accomplishments and or milestones are you the most proud of on the Van Winkle brand and what you've created? Well, I didn't create anything, but I had a lot of help coming up with the Pappy label and the whole distribution and the what I mean, the bottle we have now was not my idea. The 12-year-old label was not my idea. Um, a fellow named Gordon Hugh, who owned the cork and his family owned the cork and bottle up in Covington, came, came to me with the bottle idea through Daryl Cordy in Sacramento, California, who had a little liquor store, wine store out there. It's just a ton of help from a lot of different people. So I'm grateful to them because Believe me, I did not do this all myself. And people think, oh, you're just a genius to come up with this brand and your marketing's incredible. You all are the marketing. Let me ask you all a question. Did you all ever, who's had Van Winkle whiskey before tonight? Did if you, you don't have a hand up, by the way, there's some at the bar. <laughs> if you just didn't know that, if we didn't say that, I wasn't sure. Sorry, sorry, Joe. That's cool. You're, I, like, I like your marketing. You must work for a big grocery company or something. That's right. I don't know. Might be. So did you ever tell anyone, when you tasted our whiskey, did you ever tell anyone about our brand? Raise your hand. You created your own competition when you did that. That was a huge mistake. <laughs> but that's also good for us because... Our marketing is you all, and word of mouth is the best thing going. I don't know what you all do for a living, but word of mouth 
It's unsolicited. It says, hey, Joe, I had this whiskey the night, or hey, Mary, Mary Ann, I just had this whiskey. It was wonderful. Go try it. So back then, you could find it, but uh, really had a lot of help. I was blessed to, to be, um, you know, we have a great product, and that has to be very important. You can't just do this. You can't BS your way through life um, completely. I've tried, I've tried a lot, but uh, you have to have a good product. And also, I have great children who have created, uh, Louise is here, her company, Pappy and Company, which has the dry goods part of our, of our family uh, enterprise, so to speak. So they use our, our brand occasionally to Pappy cigars, Pappy syrup, aged in bourbon barrels, yada, yada, yada. But they've got a, a great business going, so very proud of them. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun family, family deal. And, Family business is tough, as you know. Um, it's harder than tough sometimes, but... Um, you guys just don't agree all the time? No, we don't somehow. I don't know. It's, it's, but it's, uh, it's, to answer your question, I can't answer your question. It, it's tough, but we've been very blessed, and it's working. And thanks to you all, it's, uh, you all have carried, the, carried the, uh, the banner to promote our brand, so I appreciate it. And thanks for coming tonight. Andrew, do you want to leave us with anything awesome before we go? Yeah, so I think I want to thank everybody for coming out, first of all, giving us your time and listening to some stories. I hope you had some fun in the process. Uh, please support the charity if you can, even if you can't uh, do the poor of Pappy, maybe, maybe consider donating to the charity and finding it on its own, and the charity's name is? Rootingforrobert.org. Okay, Again, so if you can't remember that, please, here in just about 30 minutes, if you follow me, Grogan Chris Fix, I will put it right up on my page as well, as I'm sure you can find it on Julian's page as well, and I know number 15 was also going to add it, so please go back and donate to them. Um, this was a great event, and we really did this because really, you know, Julian asked for this charity, and we were going to make sure it happened, so let's empty that bottle tonight, please. All right, and why don't we close, so again, um, why don't we close with a quick toast, and then we'll have a, I think we've got some performance after this, right? We do, we do. All right, so if you've got a drink, please raise it. And I'm, I can't take credit for this toast. Julia mentioned Freddie Johnson, an iconic person at Buffalo Trace Distillery. And um, I, I borrowed this toast from him, but there are tall ships and small ships. There are wooden ships that sink. The best ships are friendships, and to those ships, we drink. Cheers, have a good evening. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Thank you guys so much for coming to our very first ever historic Whiskey Rose Speaker Series. I do want to let you all know that we are going to be doing this uh, a lot more. This was just the kickoff to this event. We have amazing more speakers. If you actually want to go through, please follow number 15 or Kroger Chris Picks to go through and look. I do want to thank Andrew and Julian as well as Preston for coming out. Please make sure you follow them. And if you haven't checked out Pappy Land by Wright Thompson, Go over and check them out. And if you need a book and you can't find it online for some reason, you know, there's a great store right down the street from here called Pappy and Company. And I'm sure that they may have a book or two and some other. Yep, and they're stuff. signed. If they're not signed, I'll be go to I'll be glad to go sign them for you. Yes. Please go over and check Thank them you out. all and thanks. Really, thank you guys very much. Big old round of applause. Thanks for to number Julie 15. Van Winkle, Andrew, Duncan, and Preston Van Winkle. Thank you guys so much.